You're about to watch a live stream from our Facebook group. It's a club where we pretty much just talk about board games all day long. And every week we give away free board games to people in the club. So if you're interested in coming to hang out with us, click the link in the description below. Hope to see you there. So what's up? As I said, uh, a lot of people probably recognize you from your frequent posts, often with some good artwork. So we got to talk about that. We got to talk about how right, right. your posting schedule and how you come up with your stuff and all that. But uh, why don't you just uh, introduce yourself because you kind of got a lot going on and I don't even know where to start. Yeah. So there, I, I have so many, um, what do they call it? I can't think of the saying, but I have a lot of projects right now that I'm working on for sure. Uh, in regards to figuring out what I'm going to post on the board game club, I use this website. Um, actually, I just use a Google search. I just search for conversation starters. And I kind of look through a list and then I'm like, I kind of um, craft it to be a board game question. Hmm. Okay. So you take a so, generic conversation starter and you like gear it towards board games? Yep. Yep. That's the secret. Okay. Oh, it's out. So, <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, yeah, it's, um, I love starting conversations, especially in the board game club group. Um, I think it's a great community. I love the energy that's in the group and, you know, just with the people I've interacted with in the group, it's been great. Um, oh, thanks. So, <laughs> so I do um, social media for Lucky Duck Games, which is a Polish board game publishing company. Uh, they're responsible for Vikings Gone Wild, Chronicles of Crime. Uh, their next game that's coming to Kickstarter is Mutants, uh, which is a card game. It's a deck builder. Uh, so I do their social media. I announced recently that I am founding the National Board Game Museum, mm -hmm. which is very, very exciting and a lot of work. Uh, and then I recently uh, started designing a children's game. Um, and the story behind that is very interesting, if you don't mind me talking about it a little bit. Sure, we got a lot to talk about. So whatever order you want to tackle it. Yeah. So um, for the children's game, uh, it's a it's a family game for two to six players. Um, the theme is Christmas theme. Uh, basically, there's this blizzard in this village, and these creatures have to climb up the, the Christmas tree and light the star in time before Santa flies by. Because if the star's not lit, he's just going to keep on traveling, and he's not going to be able to see the village and deliver presents. So it's a cooperative game for two to six players. It's a family game. Uh, but the it's really weird how it came about. So about three weeks ago, I went to a psychic <laughs> for fun. Of course. And the, the psychic <laughs> told me, she's like, you're going to design a children's game. And I was like, Shut up. No, I'm not. So wait, <laughs> I, did, no. Can I ask you a question? Did she actually, did she know that you were involved in the game industry at all? Uh, she might have. I, I've been to her before. Okay. Um, I was going to say, so, this must be the best psychic in the world if you just walked in off the street and she was like, no, no, no. you're going no, to design a before, children's so. game. <laughs> No, yeah, she, 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 um, we're not like Facebook friends or anything, but I have, it wasn't the first time I, I saw her. It was like, I've been to her several times before, but she was very specific in saying you were going to design a children's board game. And mm. I just kind of shrugged it off. I was like, okay, whatever lady. Okay. Um, and then I, about two weeks after the psychic reading, my uh, dad calls me and he's like, hey, uh, I have this coworker and they, they know this, this uh, woman and she's designing this children's game that she needs help with. And mm -hmm. I recommended that um, she uh, reach out to you. And it was just like, it, like a light bulb went off in my mind, like, oh my gosh, this is what the psychic was talking about. Yeah. Um, and it was really crazy and I got connected with her and we're working on a game together. That's actually not the Christmas game. Oh, so, but they're both children's yeah. games, but they're both children's games. So do you, so, do you typically play games with games with children? No, no, that's the thing is that's I funny. don't, I, huh. uh, yeah. And then I went over to, uh, uh, a family friend's. I basically I went over to a family friend's house 
and uh, the dad of the family was talking about how I've been developing this brand and um, I figured out what I wanted to do with the brand. I want to design a children's game. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like it was literally in a span of like two days, two people contacted me about children's games. And it was just, now I'm working on both of them. And it was just very weird. It was like, she was, uh, she pinned it on the nose, you know, Mm. it was, and um, what's also weirder is that the woman that I'm co-designing the other game, not the Christmas game, but the other game, Mm -hmm. she got a fortune cookie (laughs) and in her fortune cookie, it said, you are going to receive an exciting phone call tomorrow. And I called her not even 24 hours later about, hey, I want to help you with your game. And it, it's just, it was a really weird experience. I don't know, you know, if you don't believe in it, that's fine. But it was just really weird to me, like all the coincidences of the psychic reading and the fortune cookie and two children's games opportunities yeah. coming to me. Yeah, it sounds like it's I got to really weird. I got to start hanging out in your town and asking people for lottery numbers or something. Right, so it sounds right. Like... Yeah, yeah. Come on over to St. Louis. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was just weird. So I figured I'd share that kind of cool funny story with you and your uh group yeah um but i find it interesting yeah that's really cool so so this is going to be your first game so you've been working in the board game industry for how long is this your first time being a social media uh, coordinator well i i was a social media manager for a hot rod shop in southern illinois Mm -hmm. um a couple summers ago but uh, as far as my first board game job, um, I started with Lucky Duck um, in July. And did you so, seek it out specifically because of your interest in board games or did that come yes. after? Okay. That's cool. Yeah. So I've, I've been really interested in board games since, I mean, since, a, since I was a kid, but really got interested into like hobby board gaming when I was in high school and I uh, found out about Ticket to Ride. Uh, yeah. um, and played that and really, really liked it and gravitated towards that and found out about Board Game Geek and all these other games, and I just fell in love with the hobby. And then um, flash forward to the summer, I kind of wanted to start, you know, getting my feet wet in the industry, and I contacted uh, a couple publishers that I thought maybe needing uh, social media help. And I ended up contacting Vince at Lucky Duck Games, and we hit it off. And I started like the next month as their part-time social media manager. So you just went out and got it. This was not an advertised position. That's no, this cool. was not an advertised position. Uh, you know, it's not something where you can just like ask and get. You know, I definitely stacked the odds in my favor because I, I handed him an entire like social media plan already ready for his company specifically he already had a plan in mind and it wasn't like a shot in the dark. I kind of already had some work done before I contacted him. That's good. Cause from the little bit that I've seen in this industry, it seems like nothing is going to just come to you. You have to like go out and get it and craft it and contact people because right. you know everybody would love to make a game and everyone would love to make the next ticket to ride or Carcassonne or whatever. Uh, you know, and it seems like almost everybody has an idea, but it's a matter of whether you're going to put forth the work. And, you know, like I talk about, I see you posting, you know, not only the board game club, but a lot of other groups. And I'm sure you're active on uh, other sites too, maybe board game geek or Reddit. Um, and, you know, you've got lots of connections. So, you know, it's definitely work. And, you know, I guess fortune favors the bold or whatever the phrase is. And uh, right, right. So, yeah, it seems like you're definitely going going out and getting it let me uh let me check in with the chat real quick because i saw some people popped in and this might freeze your face i'm not sure we got okay. thomas audrey and sydney what age will the christmas game or both games be starting at that's a great question um is that from audrey that one is from sydney sydney thank you yeah. for the question because sydney's got a few kids she chats a, a lot about she posts a lot of pictures talks a lot yes so uh the game, the Christmas game will be for four and up. Um, I actually oh, did a young. play test. I did a play test this weekend with a four year old, six year old, and eight year old. They were all siblings. And all of them really enjoyed the theme. They understood the goal of the game. They really enjoyed the gameplay. So uh, the four year old was able to grasp 
the concept very well and really enjoyed it. And because it's a cooperative game, um, they were really able to help each other out um, and uh, with teamwork to accomplish the goal of the game. Uh, but basically, yeah, it's for four and up. Um, and even as old as eight years old or nine years old, they still really have enjoyed the game as well. Yeah, I think it's it's a really good idea for young kids, especially like four, to do co-op because there's such a right. there's such a gap between like a four year old and an eight year old. It's not they can't even really play the same game if it's competitive. But right. even, even my five year old is really smart and can play most games. He prefers the co-op games because he just doesn't like the conflict at this point. He, he has trouble losing. So. Yeah, and I think, you know, because of the theme and the time of year it might be played, it's just kind of a feel-good, you know, kind of game where you can all team up as a family to accomplish the goal, the objective, and, you know, whether you're in your PJs and the fire's roaring and you got the Christmas tree off in the background, you know, it's, it's a very uh, Christmassy holiday game, and I think a lot of families are going to enjoy it. Cool. So are you, when are you looking to have it out? Are you looking to have it out before this uh, holiday season or before next holiday season? It'll or be just... before next holiday season. Are you going to look to have so it? Not, like... so, so Christmas 2019. Okay, so you, you are looking to have it around that time, uh, not yes. like in like May or something like that. You want it to be... No, we definitely want to release it near Christmas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that'll give you plenty of time too to work out all the kinks. Right. Yeah. And it being my first game, you know, it's just a learning experience. So we're definitely giving us more time than maybe other publishers would need just because it is our first game. Yeah. You want to get it right. Um, so speaking of yeah, first time putting something out, is was your book your first Kickstarter? Your first yes. Kickstarter? And that was... Yeah. Uh, I guess by any estimate, a pretty huge success, right? What would it like almost a thousand percent overfunded, something like that? Nine hundred? Yeah, it was close. Uh, the The original goal was six thousand for my book, and if you are interested in checking that out, you can search for the love of board games on Kickstarter. Um, you can still pre-order it. Um, the Kickstarter is over, right? But you could still pre-order. Right. Mm -hmm. Correct. So the original goal was 6,000 and we ended up getting uh, a total funding uh, being 56,000. So almost 60,000, which would have been a thousand percent. So we were super close to that, but mm -hmm. it still totally um, exceeded my expectations. And I was really pleased with how it turned out for sure. So how quickly did you reach the funding goal of 6,000? Was that the first day? Oh, was that the first day, yeah. Yeah. How was that it for was you? Quickly. Oh, oh my gosh. I just remember when I clicked that launch button and I was just like, you know, Susie backed and Mark backed and, you know. It's constantly Jack hitting backed. refresh. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's just like, it's just a, it's just a rush of adrenaline. It's like, oh my gosh, all these people believe in my idea mm. and they're interested in it and they're excited about it. And it's just a really good feeling when all that hard work really pays off. Were you were you surprised? Were you expecting it to be that successful, or or were you was, were you I, kind of not sure if you'd fund or how quickly you'd fund? I I definitely think we would have. I definitely didn't have any doubts about funding, but the fact that we reached over fifty k was like completely a surprise. I mean that even twenty k was just like wow that's crazy and then like by the end we were over fifty k and I just was flabbergasted it was crazy. So because uh, you have the the hardcover book and then you have digital and were there other rewards or were those paperback the, and paperback okay so what what was the split you know basic split of digital versus non digital? Uh, so there were over two thousand backers. And of those, let's just round it down to 2,000, mm -hmm. uh, five, a little over 500 people backed the digital version of the book. Mm -hmm. So um, a little less About than a, a fourth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then um, the majority of the backers backed the paperback version. Um, and then I also had a combo pledge level where you could get the digital copy and the paperback. Mm-hmm. 
And then I'd say I'd say a fourth or a third back the hardcover. Because to me, like thinking from a, a business perspective, if I were to make a game and then you put it out there, even if it wildly overfunds, you don't necessarily make a lot more money unless there's some economies of scale, right? Because your 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 game still costs, you know, maybe it costs twenty bucks to make, and if you know if you charge thirty, forty, whatever it is. Uh, right. versus, but the having a digital version, that's just I would think that that's all just like profit pretty much. Profit. Right. Yeah. So it that's pretty awesome. much is. I mean, like I'm not going to have to do any printing or shipping on those orders, mm -hmm. which is nice. So they paid ten dollars for the book to get the content. And then it's simply, you know, sending them the link Click and an email. Yeah. Different. Yeah. Yeah. So that's awesome. Exactly. Yeah. So can we can we talk about this campaign a little bit? How long were you um, were you planning the campaign before you it actually launched? It was thirty launched? days. Well, I mean, was, before, oh. before, like, how long did you from like I'm gonna do a Kickstarter and here's my plan until actually launching the event? So I, I think I, I mean, from the from very early in the concept, I I wanted to do a Kickstarter. I started writing the book in February of this year, mm -hmm. uh, but really didn't start marketing it until like early summer. Um, so I gave, I had about three months of pre-marketing before and, it launched uh, um, at the end of August. And so what were some of the things that you did to market it? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we did a few ads on Facebook but I think the majority of it was just word of mouth. Um, I, I, I was on a lot of different podcasts and blogs. And mm. I did a lot of interviews with a lot of different people in the industry to get the word out. Um, so, I mean, it was like almost every night I was doing a different interview with someone. So a lot of uh, podcasts. a lot of time, a lot of sweat equity kind of. Yeah. Yeah. So I was I I. I was a guest on a lot of different shows and different articles for board mm. game reviewers uh, and board game audiences. And then I also posted on Facebook groups and um, those communities and kept them in the loop and tried to get them involved in the decision making of like, which artwork do you like most and which cover design is your mm -hmm. favorite and stuff like that. And then I also accumulated um, 500 emails to my email mailing list oh okay and who did you use for that and the reason why i ask all these mailchimp mailchimp okay and i'm asking a lot of very specific questions uh because right. i know there are a good amount of people in the board game club that are interested in kickstarting their own game or, or getting into this kind of right. thing so rather than you know just kind of generic questions i'm really trying to get in the nitty-gritty i think you probably appreciate that because you because your website kind of focuses on the business side as well right in your podcast right no i i totally get that i think the more specific the questions, the better, because then you're going to be able to actually use those tactics in your own um, Kickstarters and board games. So, I mm -hmm. mean, because everyone can talk generically about Kickstarter, but, you know, people want to know, like, what what mailing software or platform did you use? Yeah. How many days did you pre-market? All those really, you know, specific answers are what I'm interested in. And I think other people are too. Right. And that's, as I do more interviews, these are the kind of questions I want to ask, because I think the scariest thing for someone who, you know, maybe they have an idea, maybe they don't, but they want, they want to get something going is like sort of like the blank canvas, like the open expanse of, wow, there's so much I don't know. And I have no idea. Okay. I have to build a community. I have to get emails. What does that even mean? So that's why I'm asking right. these, uh, very specific questions. And so you said you got a, a mailing list of around 500 people and uh, yes. got them, and you held on to them. And I'm guessing you set up an autoresponder sequence or, uh, or just kept them updated. Well, the mail, the mailing list was mostly used on like day one and the last 48 hours. Okay. I didn't really use, utilize it that much after, I mean, other than that, mm -hmm. uh, but I also built up a Facebook group um, with, I don't even know how many members we have. I think around 500 mm -hmm. um, for the love of board game dash book, uh, which is just a Facebook group about my book and updates about it. So I was able to accumulate a lot of members on there before the Kickstarter launched. 
And so, so is it is that where you got the the emails, um, the five hundred emails? Mostly, well, yeah, mm -hmm. did, from members on the group. So I see uh, what internet marketers do sometimes. This is I, I'm I'm kind of um, trying to keep tabs on internet marketers and see how that could benefit board gamers. Um, a lot of right. times I see what they do is they give away something in exchange for an email address. Um, you know, whether yeah, it's Yeah, I like did a, that. I, so what, what kind of uh, thing did you give away? Well, I did some giveaways on different board game groups outside of my book Facebook group mm -hmm. to get them on the group. Um, and so they would get notifications when I would post on there about the book. Mm -hmm. So I would give away some of my own board games in my collection. Oh, okay. You kind of call the uh, old games from your shelf. It's like a, it's kind yeah, of. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm, I, win -win. I'm like super, I'm a, I'm a, I'm super careful with my collection and I, I take care of my games and, you know, games that just hadn't gotten to the table yet or um, were brand new and I just hadn't played yet. I'm like, you know what, I'll just give this away so I can help promote the book. That's good. And I was, I, I made it clear that it wasn't new, you know, mm -hmm. but it was still a free game that ah. I would ship to you. Yeah, people don't care. Uh, let me yeah. check in. I see some more people came in the chat. Okay. Let's see. We got Sydney, thank you for your answer before. Morgan Williams is in. He says, good evening. We got good Sean evening. Chrissy Moore, Ray Myers. Says he can't wait for the book. Jay Goddard popped in. Ray Myers, 50K, well-deserved. I think he's talking about your Kickstarter there. Oh, and, thank you. And, I appreciate that. And Morgan Williams saying thanks. I don't know what he's saying thanks, but uh, you're welcome, Morgan. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Whatever. Uh, let's see. What else did I have here? There, there's so much. Because you do so much, there's so much to ask. So, You know, see. one thing we were talking about is like when people are about to start a board game project and it's just, it's just, there's so many things so that, much you know you don't know mm -hmm. or you're you're trying to learn about especially with this museum that i'm trying to open mm -hmm. oh my gosh there are so many things i have to do and if i yeah. thought about every little thing i had to do i would go crazy and we're so talking about I, a physical museum right like uh not like a yeah. virtual i don't i don't know yeah this will be a physical museum that i'm hoping will have like fifty thousand square feet or more wow um and uh, because there's a lot of board games and they need to pre be preserved and exhibited and all that. Uh, but I digress. But basically what I mean is when I tackle anything, I try to look at the first obstacle or the first hurdle in my way. Mm -hmm. And I just look at that one thing and I try to tackle that first before looking at the next hurdle. It's all about just channeling your energy towards one task at a time and then worrying about the next thing when you get there. So um, so kind of like having like a bias towards action and getting some momentum to keep you going. Yeah, yeah. Because I mean, if you tried to, you know, if I was, if I'm like, man, I'm not going to open this museum for three years, which is probably likely, mm -hmm. then it, it's it can get depressing. It can be like, well, what's the point? You know, it's taking so long. But if I look at, okay, what can I accomplish today? I can maybe work on the logo redesign. I can get our, we can work on getting our landing page done. We can file for incorporation. All these little baby steps to make the dream reality is what I like to focus on because then, then at the end of the day, it's like I did accomplish something. I didn't accomplish, you know, opening the museum, but I accomplished something that's going to get me there. So and that's what I like to do with all my projects. So let me ask you this. So before this, la this, this most recent Kickstarter, the book, For the Love of Board Games, you, you didn't have, you were working in the board game industry, but you didn't have your own kind of thing going on, right? Correct. This is the first Correct. one. And so it seems like as within the past two months or so, you've, uh, let me just count. Let me know if my, my timing is off, but we got a book, which overfunded a thousand percent. You started a podcast. I see you have a website. That might be an, an older website, but I, I first noticed it in the past two months. And you're creating two board games and a national board game museum. And as far as I know, this all happened within like maybe 90 <laughs> days, right? Like yeah. I know some of it is, you know, in the works, like you're working on the book earlier, right. but it all seems to happen just happen very quickly and doing like opening a museum. That's very ambitious. So what, what was behind that? Well, 
yes, I am crazy. And yes, I have a lot of projects that I'm working on. Um, but you know what? It's, it's because I'm passionate about this hobby. It's, it's really, there's so much energy I have for these projects because I just love it so much. It's not a chore. It's not homework. It's not something I don't want to work on. It's not a, you know, something that it's hard to work on. It's something I'm excited to work on. And, you know, I don't have any deadlines. It's not like I'm full-time freelancer. So it's like, I'm scrambling to get everything done. It's like, I work on it when I have time. And as I have an idea, you know, I just, I run with it and see if it's worth pursuing. There's other board game projects that, uh, you know, I've had ideas for, but I've killed them because it's like, I just don't have enough time for it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, that may be crazy to think that, you know, I'm tackling that much and I already have more ideas, but, but it's true. I, I've already killed some other ideas because it's just, I can't take <laughs> on too much. Cause I don't want, I don't want the other projects to suffer that I'm more excited about. Right. So your, um, uh, your board game cafe on the moon, we're going to, we're going to save that for like 2000. Right, we're going to save 20. that one. Yeah, exactly. You can't, you can't do too much. Right. Can't get too ambitious. Right. Oh. Um, but your original question, I think, was uh, remind me you were asking about. I, I was just oh, wondering, museum. yeah, like what what made you? Because like you know, like everybody wants to make a game, everyone wants to do certain things, but like a museum, like what what made this idea come to you? Yeah, that's a good uh, good question. I, whenever I approach any idea, I'm trying to think what what is everyone else doing and what's something I can do differently. Mm -hmm whether that's an entirely new concept like the board game museum or if it's something that a lot of people are doing, but I have a different angle on it. Um, so with every project, new project I take on, I try to do something different and original and unique. Um, and with this museum, I was thinking like there needs to be a networking group, a professional networking group for the board game industry. And I kind of like, played around with that for a few days and there are some networking groups out there. Mm -hmm. Um, but then I was like, do, is there even a national board game museum? I'm really curious now. Cause I, it just kind of popped in my head and I did a little research on Google and stuff. And there's really nothing to the magnitude of what I thought a board game museum should be. There's, there's plenty of museums around the United States that have board game exhibits, but there's no museum that totally focuses solely on board games. What about in Europe? Because that seems like the kind of thing that would definitely be in Germany or something. <laughs> yeah, there's one in Switzerland, I believe, like the mm -hmm. Swiss Museum of Games or something, but mm -hmm. nothing in the United States. There's a little games and puzzles museum up in Oregon, but they're, they basically, it's almost like a cafe without food. You just go and play games there. Oh. Um, it's not, they don't really have any exhibits. So are you, um, are you looking to open this in, in your town? You're St. Louis, right? Yeah, I'm in St. Louis. Um, we're definitely looking at other options too, but St. Louis is definitely in the running for sure. Uh, this is a, a, a side tangent here, but um, Jamie Stegmeyer, he's from St. Louis, right? That's correct. Have you, uh, was he in your book? Is he one of the people that you interviewed? He is. Hmm. Yep, I interviewed him about, um, is it Viticulture? Is that how you pronounce it? Viticulture? I say Viticulture. I don't okay, know. Okay, Viticulture. That's probably right. It, I butcher everything. It's I one come of those. From a <laughs> I come from a family that we pronounce Chick-fil-A, Chick-fil-a, so I don't, you you can't trust me with Chipotle. pronouncing things. Yeah, there's a, lot of, yeah. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of words that you only see written unless I someone know. happens to say it. So Exactly. Uh, so you, I interviewed him about vita culture and then i also interviewed him about scythe oh, okay. so he's in my book yep i feel like you're in the same town you guys should hang out you guys should do some games together is that yeah i've actually i've been over to his apartment before oh, okay. and I, uh, I actually interviewed him at his apartment for my documentary that i did for a class of mine all oh, right uh, the, that i saw it on youtube right it's about 10 minutes or so 13 minutes yeah Yep. It's just a short little documentary about the mm -hmm. industry. Um, it's almost like a trailer for a larger documentary. It, but that my almost, class assignment was just had to be ten minutes long. So yeah, it seems I like Jamie. Um, almost like a prequel to your book, kind of. Because it seems like a lot of those people you probably had in the book, right? Yeah, I I definitely 
uh, I interviewed some people via Skype, like Dan King from uh, the Game Boy Geek, and I also interviewed Tom Vassell from the Dice Tower mm -hmm. um, and some other people, but I interviewed a lot of local St. Louis board game professionals in my hometown. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely a cool documentary. You guys should check it out. Uh, how, how do people find that? What's uh, what's the title? You just search the board game boom on YouTube That's and it, it'll yeah. pop up. Cool. Yeah. So speaking of all these people, this is something else I was wondering when I first saw your uh, the lineup in your book. And it is, what is it, 50? Is it exactly 50 or, or 53. more? 53, like AA list board game people. Like we're talking Jamie Stegmeier, uh, Matt Leacock, who else? Did you get Rob Davio? Was he in there? I feel like... Uh, I talked with him, but we ended up uh, deciding to not do the interview it wasn't anything against him it was just we ended up not doing the interview but um yeah i talked to richard garfield of magic the gathering i talked to reiner caninzia um i talked to bruno catala Cathala, whatever you want to call yeah his last name and if anyone here just goes to their board game collection and looks closely at the boxes you'll see like all of these names on, on everywhere it's some serious people. So my question is, how the hell did you find all these people? Why did they talk to you? I don't know, to be honest with you. <laughs> I was just this annoying girl that kept emailing them. But um, basically, I looked at my own collection. Just like you said, I looked mm -hmm. at who these designers were of my favorite games. And I just went down the list of my collection. My collection's around 150 board games. So I... I just looked at my favorite games and I'm like, okay, I want to contact this person, this person, this person. And I just made a long list and I made a Google doc and I contacted them or tried to. And if they said yes, I'd, I'd highlight them green. If they said no, I'd highlight them red. If, um, if they um, didn't get back to me, I just left them blank. But I eventually got enough greens where I'm like, wow, I could turn this into like a book or something, you know, like, so what, um, what was the original intention? Was this for the documentary or do you just, no, it was, it was definitely for a, a book, but it was just, it was crazy how many people actually wanted to be a part of it. So I was like, mm -hmm. this could be a full fledged, every chapter is a different designer, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but it really just stemmed out of curiosity. I always wanted to learn you, you know, you play a game, but you don't really think about who was the person that actually made this game. What do they like? What are their, how do they design games? Do they design mechanics first? Do they design theme first? Mm -hmm. How did, what was the inspiration behind their game? Was it something that, you know, was a, a family event that inspired it? Was it something that they just sat down and tried to think of a concept for? So all those questions I was curious about, and no one really talks about it. Everyone just talks about how fun the game is, and they don't really talk about the story behind the game, and I wanted to do that for a large audience. Yeah. Yeah, it's almost weird to see the person that made a game or the team that made a game, and it's like, oh, wow, you're just like normal people that, you know, maybe you have a kid, maybe you have a dog, and, you know. And you're going to you learn those Starbucks. fun facts in the book. <laughs> yeah. You're going to learn what they like to do when they're not designing board games, whether they design games part time or full time or just for fun. Yeah. If it was their only design, if they have a hundred designs, you know, you're gonna learn all of that in the book and it's just gonna be kind of this fun fact filled book that you can read about. Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Let me check in again, see if anyone else popped in the group here. Let's see. I'll take some old games. Looks like Eric wants some of your old games. Too bad, Eric. Okay. You're too late. No, <laughs> I'm saying no. Okay. Uh, like hearing about the talk on game logistics. Keith Cantrell joined in. Keep it in St. Louis. It's within a short drive. I guess he's talking about the um, the museum. museum itself. Yeah, he, he greedily wants yeah. it. I think you should have it in uh, central southeastern Pennsylvania, but that's just me. For my own, for my own purposes. <laughs> so it's like right in your backyard. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't, I don't want to. I can't be bothered to go to St. Louis. No, actually, right. but maybe though, if it's how far is um, St. Louis from Indianapolis? That's where Gen Con. Yeah, it's like really. um, it's a little less than four hours. So I guess that that probably came into your calculation a little bit, right? The closer you can get to Gen Con, that's like a no-brainer. If someone's gonna take that trip out there, then. 
you know. Right, right. If you can make it. They're already going to be in the Midwest, you know. Yeah. Yeah, if they're already going to be in the Midwest, why not put it there, you know. Yeah. Let's see. Let's see what other questions I have. Because as I said, you got so much going on. Any advice for aspiring interviewers? Because at this point, you've interviewed at least 53 people, probably even more, I would imagine. Uh, What advice do you have besides having, if you don't mind me saying, a great, a great voice? When uh, when I listen to some of your interviews, just uh, oh, thank you. A good uh, as someone who's very self conscious about his voice, you know, when you talk, it's just very smooth, calm, and that it just it sounds like you either have experience or you're just a natural at it. So so what do you got? I'm flattered. I'm I've never gotten that compliment before. So thank you so much, Bobby. I appreciate that. Um, So my advice when conducting an interview, first off, there's there's hundreds of blogs on this on how to conduct an interview. So I, I encourage you to Google that and see what you come up with on your Google resort or Google searches. Um, but my personal advice is to definitely come prepared, research the person you're interviewing, research their background, their, what their craft is. If it's about board games, what games have they designed? You know, what awards have they won? Stuff like that. And then um, figure out what you're most curious about. You know, for me, it was like, how did you come up with this design? Was it, what was the inspiration? So I crafted a lot of questions around that. So I would, you know, just really think and take some time to sit down and ponder, what do I want to know about this person? And craft questions that will get those answers out. Never ask a question that's a yes or no answer question like do you like puppies yes or no never ask a question like that why do you like puppies you know ask a question that's going to actually get a paragraph or two out of them you know where it's not just going to be a a one word response a little open-ended yes definitely open-ended questions um definitely organizing your questions so it almost already forms a story is great too so don't just like type them up as you have them, you know, like, oh, this question, boom, 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 boom. <laughs> like I did for this interview? Just kind of no, random. No, no, no. <laughs> but it's like if once you have all your questions down, really think about how you want to structure it. Talk about maybe their background first, then go into some of their games and then some of their recreational hobbies or whatever. But try to go in a nice flow, you know, order of things uh, when you're conducting an interview because then it just flows naturally for the interviewer for sure. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, I think the only thing we haven't touched on is uh, the podcast. And and I remember I listened to the first one. Have there been uh, other ones come out or are we on the first? So we've, we've recorded nine episodes Nice with, with uh, nine different guests uh, in the board game industry. We've talked to a rule book, um editor we've talked to uh board game developers we've talked to board game designers we've talked to kickstarter experts uh so a variety of people um that i think people are going to find interesting especially if they're interested in board games and the industry um I need to be better about posting them. It's just, honestly, the podcast has taken a back burner to some of my other projects. Yeah. The the Board Game Cafe on the Moon, obviously, took a right. lot of time. That's so. taken a lot of time, yeah. especially working with NASA and their schedule. So Budget cuts. Um, yeah. Right, right. <laughs> so, um, but, I mean, the podcast is still alive. It's just not, it's definitely one of my projects that, it just hasn't gotten the attention it deserves lately. Yeah, well, I mean, having want... nine of them recorded, that's that's probably the hardest part. You know, uploading it to iTunes is probably relatively, you know, if you, if you find a weekend, you could get all that sorted out. Right, exactly. Um, so I definitely, you know, I love that we're talking about it because it just motivates me to <laughs> work on it. I'm, so... not, I'm not trying to shame you into putting out more, more posts, yeah, Aaron. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. okay. Um, but... Honestly, you know, it's just, it's, I go back and forth about, you know, like, do I start working on this board game stuff more than part time, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, well, that's the dream, right? That's the end goal. Yeah. Right. It is. Um, 
And I think a lot of us, a lot of content creators like myself and you can relate to the fact that, you know, we're not able to make it full time at this point. Um, so it's really all about the hustle and, you know, sticking to it. And eventually, hopefully, you know, we will have a full time career in this industry. It's just um, there's definitely a balance as far as, you know, work and play goes for sure. Yeah. And uh like you say, at least it's something that you really love and enjoy. You know, if if uh, you had a podcast about accounting or something like that. Oh, my gosh. Or, uh, yeah. you know, making the National Law Museum. You know, you probably wouldn't right, be that right. motivated to keep all your projects oh going. Oh, my gosh. But uh, it wouldn't even it wouldn't even get off the ground at all. Yeah. I wouldn't do anything. It would be it would be coming soon for like 20 years. Yeah. So. so all this stuff is a lot of work. I know from the board game club, which started out as a, you know, a pretty small thing. And now it's on the verge of 5000 members. And, you know, out of nowhere, awesome. suddenly, yeah, it, it just it takes up a lot of time, <laughs> you know, and, and you want to you want to connect with everyone you want to answer. And it is fun. But, you know, it's it takes up a lot of time, too, when you have you know, like a regular day job like I do and, and kids exactly. and wife and a cat that needs to be pet and all that stuff. Yeah, so, exactly. That cat, you know, it, it, I mean, it, it needs attention. She needs at and, least seven hours petting a day. So, right. Uh, um, but no, congratulations to you with the, the growth of your group. That's awesome. Yeah. I, it's been exciting. I, lo Thanks. I love, I love that more and more board game groups are popping up on social media. Cause I just, mm -hmm. I think this hobby is just going to continue to skyrocket. I love the fact that people are are putting their phones away and unplugging and engaging with cardboard and cards and dice and just really connecting with one another. That's why I love the hobby so much is because you can really interact with the people around you in a fun, you know, interactive way. Yeah, and, and I look forward to it getting even more mainstream and not in like a, a sellout sort of way, but sort of the way that like, let's say like fantasy became mainstream through like Harry Potter and Game of Thrones, where all of a sudden you're not like necessarily a nerd in your mom's basement if you're into right. dragons. Now it's like, you know, like everyone that I know watches Game of Thrones and that sort of thing. And, and I look forward yeah. to um, board games, same thing, where it's not something that's like snickered at. It's, you know, it's just, it's just something that's normal and cool. I mean, Bobby, if you haven't realized, board games are cool now. Oh, no, I, mean? I, I, I know. I've always known they were cool. It's just I needed, yes, the, I needed like, the rest of the world to catch up. That's, and I, exactly, think, I think we're, I think exactly. we're getting there. So We are. We are slowly but surely getting there. We're and getting I mean, there. think about it. I mean, Board Game Geeks Facebook group has like, what, 60,000 members or something crazy like that? Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just love it. I love the growth that the industry is getting. Yeah. And that just means that there's going to have to be more innovative projects that come out and, you know, um, just no, I mean, if you're thinking about starting a board game review channel, go for it. But before you do think about, okay, are there like 20 more channels that are exactly like the one I'm going to create? Or am I going to do something a little bit different, a little bit different of a spin on this where it's going to make my channel unique and one of a kind? So whenever you're thinking about designing a game or starting a publishing company or creating a you know, YouTube channel or YouTube video on board games, think about always have the mindset, what can I do differently that no one else is doing? Mm -hmm. Or I think that's something everyone needs to think about when they're thinking about creating content for the industry. Yeah. And anyone looking to get into anything like this, you're going to have to just be consistent and, you know, work your ass off as well. It's, it's not enough to just be, you know, just be, have a great idea. It's, you got to just plug away at it and have something new and novel as well. And one of the biggest, uh, you know, a lot of, I almost I asked almost every single designer in the book what advice would you give to aspiring designers. Mm -hmm. So a lot of aspiring designers I think are going to find the book very helpful. Uh, but a lot of them said, um, you know, you may have a great concept for a game, but it's not going to be a game unless you get it down on paper. You know, even if it's on note cards and you know, paper dice or whatever, you have to get it down and 
get it out of just an idea in your head. Because if it's an idea in your head, it's no better than someone's pile of junk over there that's physical, that actually they did some work and developed the idea, you know, whether it, you know, because yours, all it is, is in your head. And that, that won't do anything except just live there. Yeah, I was reading a blog post of Jamie Stegmeyer's the other day, and it said pretty much the exact same thing, that you could have the greatest idea in your head, and someone else could have the crappiest prototype, and theirs is like 100 times more valuable than your idea, because it exists, it's out there. It's, uh, right. you know, it's something, right. something that's on its way to being something else. Exactly. So, really good stuff. Any other, any other questions? I think... Uh, I don't see any new questions. I think, uh, why don't we just give you a chance to just plug your many things, how people could find your stuff. And, uh, okay. <laughs> Let me take a deep breath. Yeah. And, right. <laughs> uh, no, but, um, so for someone, for people interested in learning more about the museum, you can go to boardgamemuseum.org. and you can follow us on social media on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook by, um, using the at or game. So museum F O R games is our social media handle. As far as my podcast go, you can search for the love of board games dash podcast, um, and join our Facebook group, um, or go to our website for the love of board games.com to check out my book. You can go to Kickstarter and you are still able to pre-order it at this point. Um, and you can search for the love of board games uh, on Google or Kickstarter, and it'll, it'll pop up. And you can join our Facebook group for the book, For the Love of Board Games dash book. Uh, what am I missing? As far as the children's games go, um, I'll definitely be posting on the board game club, you know, with some uh, and other Facebook groups where um, with maybe my, you know, game design development and getting your guys' feedback. So just be on the lookout for that. It's still in the early stages. Um, and I think that's about it. Um, thank you so much for having me on this live stream. I had a lot of fun. Yeah, this was good. Thanks so much for being on here. And yeah. Lots of good advice, lots of good tips, and uh, looking forward to the next six projects you come out with in the, in, you know, the next month <laughs> the or the two. The next week, so, right. Yep. Be good. All right, thanks a lot, Aaron. I'll see you in thank the you. club. <laughs>